a member of Jackson Walker set that P.O. box up within a day or two of filing this petition in clear violation of the venue statute that says principal place of business is to establish within 180 days of filing. That cannot possibly be what our venue statute anticipated and what the U.S. Supreme Court anticipated when establishing a principal place of business. So we have a problem here that is systemic and it's also specific to this case. And with that, in, with that please do not interrupt my argument. Sit down. People are allowed to make openings. Just stay. Thank you, Your Honor. And as, as to Jackson Walker, I'm going to, Mr. Congress, I'm going to grant you a little discovery. You've got to go back and read what you're asked for. But, but I do think there, there's a 327 issue. I've been really struggling to make this video, and not because Mr. Culberson didn't score a major victory for himself here in this most recent hearing in the Sorrento case, but because a lot of it's stuff that I've already gone over and already had my conclusions on. This was just the final episode on some of those conclusions, and so I was really struggling to find why this needed a follow-up video or how to even structure it, because yeah, yeah, we've known this for a while. So in order to get some sort of insight, I sat down and talked with a friend of mine who is a bankruptcy lawyer and also subscribed to this channel and tried to see if I could come up with additional things that I could use to help influence and inform the things I'm about to talk about in this video. Before we get to that though, we should probably put a nice little bow and wrap up all the things that have been going on so far. In the most recent hearing, Mr. Colberson got his discovery on Jackson Walker. In addition, he brought up the P.O. Box issue that I had been complaining about not being brought up to this point. The court currently has a hearing scheduled for March 11th on the issues of venue and the potential dismissal of the bankruptcy or in the alternative, it being reverted to a different venue, more than likely either in California or Delaware depending on what the debtors decide if the motion is granted. In addition, I was only recently informed as I was going through and editing this video that the U.S. trustee has joined Mr. Culberson in having either the case dismissed or the venue transferred because of this P.O. Box situation. This adds a lot more credibility to the fact that this venue will be transferred, but I would also state that this doesn't mean that this is necessarily an outcome that will get shareholders the reimbursement they wish. After all, the majority, if not all, of the principal assets of the company have been sold, and there's no undoing and rewinding that and doing it all over again. You change the venue, you're basically going to be going over all these same documents all over again, minus the fees that everyone had been complaining about, but really the fees are not the major part of the issue in this bankruptcy. And really the only thing to be gained is possibly that Silex Holdings would be sucked into this bankruptcy now without the Texas two step in the way. An important thing to keep in mind when going over this situation. The next thing I wanted to deal with before I got into the meat of this video was the appeal filed by the official equity committee in regards to Judge Lopez denying their 2004 discovery. I don't think that this is going to go anywhere in particular, especially with the case of bankruptcy 2004 discovery. There's just such a wide scope of discretion given to the judge that this will not be taken de novo on appeal. The entire basis for determination will be the abuse of discretion standard. And that's basically the standard that the only way that on appeal the decision would be overturned is that the judge so abused their discretion that it is so blatantly obvious that it should be appealed. And that is such a high bar and a high standard to get over that it's not likely that it will be overturned on appeal. Now as to the uh, friend I talked about from earlier in the conversation we had, I think a good place to start off is sort of where I left off in my previous discussion. We both are in pretty firm agreement that even in the best of circumstances that 
Mr. Culberson gets the motion that he wants, it's still highly unlikely that any shareholders will receive recovery. And it's my opinion that more than likely any sort of forward progress in this manner at best would help the general unsecured creditors at most. I know there has been a big to do about the fees involved in this case, but looking at the company's assets and expenses and liabilities and what's gone on in this bankruptcy so far, it doesn't really meaningfully change things for shareholders. However, I would point out that the main purpose for shareholders, unfortunately, is using this case as a reason for appealing to their legislature and the federal government for changing of the bankruptcy law. After all, this whole process took place because of this manufactured venue and these special rules that take place in Texas and some of these other states and has even been brought up to the Supreme Court for review for certain circumstances. Really, I think though that taking this to the Supreme Court is kind of passing the buck. The onus on this lies with the legislature and Congress to fix the bankruptcy laws, and I'll get into that a bit more in a second. Probably the most eye-opening thing to me is when I brought up this recent filing by Mr. Culberson and jokingly asked my friend to guess when it was that this P.O. box was opened in relation to the bankruptcy filing in Texas. And he said, oh, probably a few hours before it was filed. For me, as someone who has no legal experience, isn't a lawyer or anything like that, that whole casualness sort of leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Even if we were to consider the idea that shareholders would gain nothing regardless of the outcome, there's something about that that just feels wrong inherently. On the flip side of that though, it was probably a good guess that I wouldn't be bringing this up if it wasn't at least a little bit salacious. And I'm in no way impugning the average bankruptcy lawyer or the system in general or whatever have you. But when it comes down to it is, if it's this obvious, surely there's something wrong here that needs to be fixed. And I again emphasize that I do believe trying to fix the system is important here. It's why previously I brought up Senator Whitehouse and his comments in the Senate about this whole Texas two-step and his disgust with it as it gives a good foot in the door for dealing with this issue. But I would note what my friend had also said, and that is that a lot of this bankruptcy code, the suggested changes that are presented to Congress, how Congress analyzes the system, is often done by the professionals involved. And that's not necessarily a bad thing or insinuates that it's corrupt. Even Mr. Culberson admits that just because a group is tight-knit does not mean conspiracy in and of itself. And I would point out the same sort of thing happens in Delaware. The shaping of the Delaware general corporate law is generally done with the assistance of the lawyers involved in Delaware. And the legislature takes those opinions into consideration when crafting their laws. But at the same time, it does create a perverse incentive structure that needs to be checked. Another reason for people to reach out to someone like Senator Whitehouse if they think this system is unfair in order to make sure it is changed so it does not happen again. Those are my thoughts on the matter so far. We'll have to wait till the hearing on March 11th to get a more clear picture of where things are going. And I do wish Mr. Culberson the best of luck in that hearing because nothing is set in stone in these sorts of situations. And it would give us a much more clear picture once that hearing is over with where things are going from here. And we can talk more about what sort of outcomes come from that situation. So once again, we're in another holding pattern to see what is the next step along this path in the Sorrento Therapeutics bankruptcy case. Till next time, I'll catch you folks around.